This morning, as we open God's Word on this Memorial Day Sabbath, I'd like to invite you to bow your heads with me in an added word of prayer as we, we open that word, shall we? Father in heaven, today, in the name of Jesus, who is our hope, who is um, the one we want to remember, may you strengthen us today and teach us, and may it inspire all of us. Amen. Amen. Indeed, it is Memorial Day weekend, and it's the weekend when most people take off to go camping. It's like the beginning of the holiday season. In fact, most Americans have forgotten the reason we have Memorial Day and what, is even, what, what the whole thing entails, and, and they view it as just another weekend off with the Monday holiday. I did some reading about Memorial Day to find out the history about it because we really have watered this whole thing down. Memorial Day was um, first initiated by General John Logan, the national commander of the Grand Army of the Republic, in 1868. Some three or four years after the Civil War had ended, he was a Union soldier, Union general, and he believed that we needed to have a day to honor the dead who had died in that horrible, horrible war between the states. You know, one thing about the Civil War, it was... First of all, neither a war, neither was it civil. It was just an onslaught of, 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 of horrible brother against brother, father against son, and vice versa. And General John Logan, the commander of the Grand Army of the Republic, decided we needed to have a day of, of remembering these who had died in, in the Civil War battles. And they called it Decoration Day where well, they would go to the graves of those soldiers who had fallen, who had been buried in Arlington National Cemetery and other cemeteries around the country, and they would decorate them with flowers and with flags to, to remember these who had lost their lives. There was a decoration day for the Southern soldiers, as was for the Union soldiers, because remember, all of them were what? Americans. I remember one time when my family and I were visiting in, in Chattanooga, Tennessee, several years ago, and we were at... Um, um, what's the name of that mountain there? Uh, it's not Stone Mountain, is it? Lookout Mountain, thank you, Lookout Mountain. We were visiting the Lookout Mountain where there'd been a horrible battle there. And we were in the, in the gift shop there at the museum and one of my boys asked me, which side was the good side? And I said, well, they were both American. We'll talk about it later, all right? Here we are in the middle of Tennessee. You, don't, you have to be careful what you say. <laughs> and... Um, I said, they, they were both American. We'll talk about it later. And he asked me again, which side was the good side? I said, we'll talk about it when we leave. And this one boy piped up who was there in the museum. He says, the South, they were the good side. <laughs> and I said, where are you from? He said, I'm from Tennessee. I said to my son, I said, we'll talk about it outside, all right? <laughs> it was a war between the states, and sometimes that war still continues, doesn't it? But... um. There were, there were Americans lost on both sides of the, of the skirmish, of the, of, of, the, of the horrific war. So it was brothers fought against brothers, fathers against sons, sons against fathers. It was terrible. My family were living in the South, my, the Bryson ancestors, and so they were in the Southern Army. And part of me want to say, you know, the, the Confederacy, that was the good side. But really, we know in righteousness and in justice, God did bring about the best result from that horrible war. He brought about the liberation of a people who had kept in bondage for hundreds of years. And he'd kept a nation together which needed to be together because remember, this nation, friends, plays a significant role in Bible prophecy at the end of time, does it not? And this nation could not be divided forever. And we praise the Lord for men like Abraham Lincoln and, and others who saw the need to keep the union together. And gratefully, we are a nation that is one. In fact, you think about it, the, in the last um, several years, we've had several presidents of our country from the South. And I believe that's a positive, because again, it shows us that we are one nation, north and south, east and west, one great nation on this continent of North America that I believe that has brought liberty and justice to a world that still wonders what it's all about. The example this nation has set. I'm proud to be an American, are you? 
we're not always proud about everything our country does. I mean, believe me, there's still sinners in our, in our land. I'm one of those sinners, but I love America and I'm proud of America. And I believe that God raised this nation up. But anyway, General John Logan decided that there needed to be a day of decoration. And so it was begun there in 1868 and later on it was changed the name to Memorial Day. And finally, as the thing began to evolve and move and shift in 1971, well, see, Memorial Day was originally on May, guess what, what day is it? May what? May 30, if you still remember. May 30 is always Memorial Day. How, and some places still, still celebrated on May 30, no matter what day of the week it falls on. But the government, 1971, put a, 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 a national holiday act into place where most major holidays would fall on what day of the week? Monday, so we could have a four day weekend. Three day, whatever, all right. <laughs> People treat it like a four day, all right. They start off on Thursday starting to get all excited. But, um, because of that, most people have forgotten what Memorial Day is, what it sig signifies. They're in Arlington National Cemetery, and in national cemeteries all across this country, flags are placed at each of the graves of, of fallen soldiers. Some who died in battle, some who died later on as a result of battle, some who later on went on to finish their lives and yet were in those wars, and yet they, they are remembered on Memorial Day. Cemeteries across the land. At the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier there in, in Arlington National Cemetery, there is that, that tomb to that soldier who was unknown what, what his name was or where he fell, but the, the soldier Mark walks in front, and every Memorial Day, the President of the United States places a wreath there at that Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. And they go around the clock, 24 hours a day, marching back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I won't even mimic it because I can't, you know, I can hardly walk. And there on that tomb it says, Here rest in honored glory an American soldier unknown or known but to God. And there at that memorial they have several other graves that are from each of the significant wars of an unknown soldier known only to God. And does that give you a stir in your heart that God knows each and every person who rests in a grave whether or not they had recognized him in their life or not, he knows them by name because you see, Christ Jesus died for every living person who's ever lived on this earth. Isn't that something? And so there at that tomb of the unknown soldier, around the clock, they walk back and forth. And I remember watching them at age eight when we visited Arlington National Cemetery and the changing of the guard every hour is quite a stunning ceremony if you've ever seen it. They changed the guard around the clock, keeping watch over that tomb in memorial of those who gave their lives. In fact, if you're there at the tomb of the unknown soldier, it is dead, dead silent. <laughs> As it ought to be around a graveyard, but it is so still. There's not a lot of talking. There's not a lot of, it, it, you, all you hear is the click of the heel of that soldier in honor and respect of those who gave their lives. Well, I'm at National Cemetery in Portland, it's a beautiful cemetery up on top of the hill, Scotts Mountain. And um, there in that cemetery as well, Boy Scouts place flags at all the graves of those veterans. It is their privilege to do that. And in that cemetery, fathers and children and mothers come and they, they place flowers, at those flag marked graves, it's thousands of them. And they remember the those that they've lost. There in that cemetery is my mother-in-law and my father-in-law are buried. And this is the road that they're buried in and their grave is marked. This is when Audrey had just died. Her marker was there along with Jack's and later we took a picture with both their names there, Meredith C. Jackson, U.S. Army Korea. Audrey's wife placed there as well. Dear people, I love them. They just were the greatest in-laws a person could have ever had. And today we're going to go back to that spot and we're going to remember them with, with flowers. And in fact, Memorial Day, which was a day was, was set aside for the memory of veterans who died in wars or were related to wars, Memorial Day has become a day when Americans remember anybody who have, in their loved family who has died and they bring flowers to cemeteries. 
And as I again said, because of the 1971 act of pushing uh, national holidays to Monday, many have forgotten what this day is all about. And they view it as a day for barbecues and camping and frolicking, and, and they don't even remember those who've died. And so today we remember. But we remember someone else who also died. The Lord Jesus Christ, who at the heat of of the largest war, the biggest, ugliest battle, civil war in the history of the universe, he, the Son of God, the creator of the universe, the, the mighty one, he stands outside of all veterans of war, does he not? For he was insulted. He was abused, he was, he was mocked, he was beaten, and he came to this earth not because he had to, but because he chose to, to redeem us and to take us back from him who had captured us. And there on the cross, Christ Jesus suffered and he died. The most bloody battle in, in the history of wars. Because you see, had Christ Jesus lost that battle on the cross, my friends, God would have died. Salvation would have been over for him and for anybody, the rest of us, and Satan would have won and the entire universe would have been a risk of annihilation. But praise God, Jesus, the sinless son of God, sinless son of God, prevailed on that cross. And they placed him in a tomb, an unknown tomb, a tomb of a friend. But hallelujah, friends. Jesus is no longer in that tomb. Can you say amen to that? Yes. Because on that first day of the week, as we know, he came up out of that tomb, and he lives, and he reigns, even now in heaven, our Savior forever and always. What a God, what a Savior. What a memorial. It was Jesus who said to break bread and to drink from the cup in memory of him. It is a memorial. In looking through the scriptures this week, I discovered several other places where the word memorial was used and what it was used in context of. And I want to look this morning at one of those in Exodus chapter 17. Exodus chapter 17 and verses 8 through 14, we find a story, a familiar story, but something about that story I had never caught before. Mentioning that word memorial. Exodus chapter 17 is a story of a battle between the Israelites who are crossing the desert, the, the hot, dreary desert, to, to go to the land of Canaan, and they encounter an enemy, the Amalekites. And there they are battled against. In fact, we read in that very first verse of that section, now Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And it was a huge battle, and the Israelites, were, while strong, they were not strong enough to prevail against the Amalekites except for an incident that took place on the mountain above. Moses, their leader, took the rod of God and he raised it toward heaven and he began to pray. And as long as his arms were raised in prayer with that rod and as long as he held it up in faith, the Israelites prevailed in battle. But whenever his arms got tired and he dropped them down, well, then the battle turned the other way and the Amalekites would win. And so we discover in this story something incredible because you see, Moses was only a human. He was tired. And two of his companions, who were they? Aaron and Hur, came up to him and they held on to him. They held on to his arms and they held them up through the battle all through that long day till the battle was over. And because of their companionship and their coming alongside of him in prayer and in physically strengthening him, the Israelites won the battle. Now we notice in verse 14 these words. Then the Lord said to Moses, who did he say it to? Moses. Moses. Write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua and I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. You tell this story, Moses. In fact, you write this story down as a what? Memorial in the book. What book was Moses to write this in? 
What book was a memorial? It was this book that the, the Hebrews, the, the Jewish people have called and they, they reverence highly. It's, it's called the Torah. The first five books of our Bibles, the first book of Moses, the second book of Moses, the third book of Moses, up to number five, Genesis through Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, those five books are the book that Moses was to write this story in and he did. And it was to be a what? A memorial to the people of God's working. I don't know if you know this, but a Torah, a roll of scripture written in Hebrew, these Torahs, even today in, in, in synagogues, are hand lettered. They're beautiful, they're beautiful scrolls. They're very, very long. And they're hand lettered. And each letter is counted specifically so that not one jot or tittle is lost. Did you know that? In fact, scribes in ancient times when they would hand write one of these, these Torah scrolls, and, and even today's Torah scrolls are hand copied. If the scribe would discover that he left out a row or left out a, a certain letter because they counted each letter, they had to crumple the thing up and start all over again. And so consequently, a Torah today to purchase one for a synagogue costs anywhere from thirty to $40,000. Because it is not only um, a work of art, but it is the scripture of God, the words of, of God given to Moses. And it's reverenced. Moses was to write down this account in the book as a what? Memorial. On this Memorial Day weekend, I can think of no greater memorial than the Bible. Amen? The, uh, the books of the Bible, 66 in all, which have been gathered and no longer are retained in scrolls, but are bound in, in book form. The picture you see on the screen is a 1611 edition of the King James Version of the Bible, preserved. And there are still some left in the world that you can purchase anywhere from one hundred to four hundred thousand dollars depending on the condition i found this picture of one of those 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 um copies printed on a gutenberg press in 1611. this is a memorial the stories in those were in those in those scriptures are a memorial to the living god who's not sealed up in a tomb can you say amen to that he is alive he's present now in the last several years, I had the privilege, and I'm gonna try to haul it over here, it's quite heavy, and sit on my stool, and Barbara, I'm glad you brought the stool up for me because um, I, I got this Bible several years ago from the community service center. Dorothy had given it to me. It had been delivered to the community center as a donation. She didn't not quite know what to do with it because it was in horrible condition. It was falling apart, and she didn't want to throw it away because it obviously was old, and, and um, it seemed irreverent to throw a Bible away anyway. And she gave it to me, and she said, is there anything you could do with this? I said, I'm sure I could find something to do with this. And uh, I'll hold it up so the cameras can catch it. It's an old Bible from the 1870s. And it's not like the one that Aaron had. Remember Aaron, who came here several weeks ago, had that one from the 1830s? Well, this is from the 18, 1870s. It was falling apart, that the cover was coming off, and I... I asked Joseph Hermans if he could find a book binder that could help repair it for me, and he did. And it cost quite a penny to get it repaired. But it stands to me as a reminder of the awesome reverence that people have had for the Word of God over the years. We have so many copies of the Bible now, we almost forget to respect it. You know, it's just an ordinary object. We have maybe 10 or more of them on our shelves and they collect dust. But you think about it, there was a time when families, if they owned a Bible, it was one like this. And there was only one in each home. Or perhaps there was one in each village. And maybe it was kept at the church and it was only heard in, 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 when it was read in church. Um, that's why they had scripture reading, by the way. You know, we have scripture reading, we, we, we do this out of tradition, but they would read whole sections, whole chapters, because that's how you heard the word. And the Bible was, rest, was reverenced, and, and people were, were persecuted for reading from the Bible. 
at some times in history. If they were caught around the table reading, they were taken away, the book was burned, and they were burned at the stake as well. And these stories God has given us as a memorial to his working among his people. These are stories of salvation. These are stories of, of hope and courage to a people, friends, who were living in the middle still of this great war that Jesus Christ has won and he's going to culminate when he comes again. Now this special copy of this, this Bible, and it's, um, it's, it's, it's still fragile even though it's been put back together. I'm gonna sit out on a table for the next few weeks in, in, the, in, the, in the lobby there by that picture of Christ. There's some candles there and there's a loaf of bread there and I would just invite you to walk by and take a look at it. You can even open the pages up and, and just sense the respect that the Bible has always had and yet I believe still needs because it is God's word to us. And I'm gonna set that table up out there as a memorial on this Memorial Day Sabbath as a reminder that we need to digest these words and not just keep it on a shelf, amen? Because these words contain in them life and life more abundantly. And I'm gonna ask one of our Pathfinder leaders, Jim here, who was our director for many years, if he would take this special Bible, if he would take it out to that table, Jim, and set it there in his place as a memorial. And you can go and look at that today after the service. And again, it will be there for several weeks, just as a reminder to um, take the Bible off our shelves and to read it and to make it part of your lives because it indeed is a memorial. I'm, I was looking at a site on the web the, the other day. It's called uh, The Great Site, www.greatsite.com. You can buy pages from the 1611 version of the, of the King James Bible. Uh, these are just sheets of them. They're, they're worth about um, uh, $400 a piece. <laughs> <laughs> and so you can have a copy of one of those Bibles that did, did fall apart. Um, or you can buy a, a whole Bible that they have about 30 of them left and they're anywhere from 100000 to $400,000 each. This Bible out here is nothing like that. But at the same time, God's Word has been preserved. And it needs to be preserved right here in our, in our minds. Do you believe that? Because it is the Word that will hold us. It is the memorial to his great salvation story. And of course, the greatest salvation story in the scriptures is that of the coming of Jesus and, and his death for us on the cross and his victory there in that unknown tomb, that unmarked tomb when he came back to life, even though there were soldiers marching in front of his tomb, a hundred of them, one angel. How many angels? One angel came and encountered 100 soldiers and laid them down as if they were dead. And Jesus came back to life because, you see, he was sinless and he was also the Son of God. And my friends, he is coming again. Do you believe that? And we as believers in the Word of God today should not only read the Word and take it in and memorize it and make it a part of our lives, but there's a specific scripture in the word found in the Torah in Exodus chapter 20. Would you turn with me to Exodus chapter 20? And there's a significant word there that is used, and I want to draw attention to this word on this Memorial Day Sabbath. Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, and on to verse 11, and I read these very familiar words to Seventh-day Adventist and to Christians around the world. Remember, what's the word? Remember. Remember, that's where we get the word memorial from. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter or your manservant or your maidservant nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. This day, the Sabbath, is a day to remember our Creator. But as the account of the same commandment in the book of Deuteronomy mentions, that it's a day to remember the deliverance from Egypt. And the Israelites were brought out of Egypt, out of the bondage of Egypt, and we have been set out of the free of the bondage of sin, hallelujah, through the cross. And the Sabbath is a memorial to the cross of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. And on that Sabbath there in the tomb, Jesus rested 
from the work that he had done in that battle. And he came forth on that first day of the week. And by the way, the first day of the week is the first day of the work week. It's not Monday, it's Sunday. And Jesus Christ came out of that tomb on the first day of the work week. The commandment said, six days you shall labor and do all your work. And so Jesus began to do his work again on that first day of the week. He came out. He confronted the devil. He told him to get back. He told Mary, I'm going back to my father. I'm going to talk to him and tell him about what I've done here on the cross to see if it's acceptable. My friends, Jesus has been working, but every Sabbath he rests with his people. Amen? And that's a memorial to us of the salvation that he has brought to us. And what is the greatest memorial a person can give to God? But I believe his life and her life. A life devoted in prayer, a life devoted in, in commitment. In fact, if, as it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, these familiar words, the words will be on the screen. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new what? Creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become what? New. The greatest memorial to the living God is a life that is changed. And by reading and meditating upon his word, we can find life and change in each of our individual lives. Is that your desire today on this Memorial Day Sabbath? To devote yourself to him as a living memorial, as a living testimony to a God that can change your life? If that's your desire, then I would invite you to stand as we pray. As we stand as a memorial to our living God, all things have become new. Father in heaven, today as we stand here on this Memorial Day Sabbath, we stand desiring to be, to be memorials to you, to be living testimonies to your power to change us as a people, as individuals. Father, we need to have sin run out of our lives and the corrupting influence of it. And we desire that you will make us instruments of your peace and of your power and of your overwhelming um, ability to, to change carnal hearts. Thank you. Thank you for this memorial of a changed life. Through Jesus we pray it. Amen and amen.